What's up? I'm Pastor Todd, and this is Pastor Daphne. We want to thank you so much for watching the message today. We believe it will impact your life. We do want to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you face to face if you're ever in the Seminole area. But we hope this message will be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for the word today. We're so grateful for what you're doing in our city, in our country even, and even specifically in our church. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're going to do what you always do. Reveal your word. Show us your heart today. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. We'll continue our series today entitled Purpose. Specifically today, part number 7, we're going to talk about the church in uncertain times. How many know where we're living in uncertain times? There's a lot of craziness that's going on in the world, and I want to talk about some of that today. And what is the place for the church in these last days? What is the purpose of the church in the last days? Romans chapter 8, verse number 28 says this, For we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. How many here with a raise of hand love God? Amen. All of us love God. Well, the Scripture says that all things work together for good for those who love God. Regardless of what's going on in the world around us, all things will work together for our good. Why? Because we love God. And it's according to His purpose and from the very fact that we are called to be a part of the family of God. Now, the big question is this. If all things are working for the girl, for the girl, for the good, <laughs> yay! When the world is falling apart, what are we going to do? Well, there's a lot of things that I, I did some, a little bit of research on, but the war reminded me of March 16th of this year, 2020. And we were actually flying back from Egypt right when everybody was kind of hoarding all the toilet paper and everything. And um, remember those days, and everything was going crazy. And we got on the plane, and this is what the Lord had told me. He said, um, when, right when I got on the plane, he said, no matter what is happening in the world, we will remain fearless. Goliath spoke fear, and the virus is speaking evil against the world. The army was in fear, but David ran towards the giant. The church will rise up and will experience revival. Our country may be in fear, but the church, like David, isn't. The church, whether in buildings or online, will be fearless. Watch and, re watch and see revival will soon be. Pastors, prepare yourselves. The beacon of light has just been turned up. The church is shining brighter than ever before. People, people all over are looking at the light in those dark times. Worldwide revival has now started in the church. This virus is just a giant that is being slayed. A new king is about to be crowned, and a new dynasty is about to start. A dynasty after God's heart, like King David. A new wave of God's presence is coming, stirring the hearts of people to have God's heart. And when he told me that in the plane, it just it went off on, on the inside of me. And I know that things are crazy right now in the world with the elections and with the virus and all this kind of stuff. But one of the things that we must always know, that we do not have to fear. There has to be this statement of fact that we refuse to be in fear with what's going on in the world. Amen. Again, here, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So what's going on in the world? Some of you might know this, some may not know this, but there has been forest fires, not only in the U.S., but in Indonesia, Brazil, Argentina, and Australia. There has been three hurricanes in the United States thus far this year. Tropical storms creating destructive floods all over the world. Large tornadoes leaving huge um, devastation in whole communities. Not only that, but there's been 11,736 earthquakes in the world ranging from 4.0 to 7.0 on the rector scale. There has been threats of war in Afghanistan, Yamin, um, Ethiopia, Africa, Libya, the United States, Iran, Israel, and the Persian Gulf. 
United States and North Korea, India, Pakistan, Venezuela, and the Ukraine. There has been rumors of war. There's been threats of war in all of those countries thus far this year. 1.24 million people have died from the coronavirus in the world today. There is now called murder hornets spotted in the U.S. And we all know this, that Mr. George Floyd was killed and exposed a tremendous civil unrest that's been in our country for decades. And even today, our democracy is even being challenged because of fraudulent ballots being investigated. If you haven't noticed, church, we are living in the last days. We are living in the last days. Well, what does Jesus say about the last days? Turn to Luke chapter 21, verse number 5. Hallelujah. Now, at the end of this service, you'll be happy. Amen. At the end of this service, you'll be encouraged. But there has to be some reality that comes to us as believers. As you turn to Luke chapter 21, for us in Gaines County, for us that you know, specifically live here in Seminole, those that drive in from Denver City, Loop, Andrews, and, and Hobbs, and all the other little towns in between, for those that are part of our service today and those that are watching online, we kind of live in a little bubble here. And we're so blessed to be living in Gaines County. We just got back from San, San Antonio a while back and, and just going in the airport and all the new restrictions that you have to have because of the virus. And then um, going into, you know, San, Angel San Antonio and, and all the restaurants and everything, it was just way different than what we have here in our town here in Seminole. But all of that's just signs of the times. Here, Luke chapter 21, verse number 5, Jesus said this. I'm going to read from the New Living's translation. Some of his disciples began talking about this majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. But Jesus said, the time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they asked, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? He replied, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and saying the time has come. But don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place first, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. Let me stop right there. Jesus is speaking here. Don't, don't forget that. Verse number 13, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. They will even kill some of you, and everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair of your head will perish. Verse 19 by standing firm, somebody say standing firm. By standing firm, you will win your souls. Let me state verse 19 again. By standing firm, you will win your souls. Jesus was making a profound statement after basically prophesying what's going to happen in the end times. And I can honestly say after just reading that short portion, we have seen all of what Jesus said was happened already. So that tells us that we are at the very end. Now we know, no man knows the time or the day whenever Jesus was to return, but we are to be aware of the signs of the times. We must be aware that Jesus is coming soon and the world is falling apart. But God still has a purpose. We should never say God still has a purpose. Turn to Acts chapter 2, verse number 16. In these times, in these uncertain times, we 
are going to stand firm as Christians. We are going to stand firm as believers. We are going to stand firm as the church in these end times. God still has a purpose. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. By this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Somebody say last days. In the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, Jesus just said in the Gospel of Luke what the last days were going to look like. And we have all seen all of the things that Jesus said what the last days would look like. But in the book of Acts, we find God's purpose. And in these last days, God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. This basically is telling us that God has a purpose in his spirit His presence is involved in it. Let me show you some things about the past several decades that's going on in the world also. God's been pouring out His Spirit all over the world for decades. In the 1960s, 400 million people lived on the continent of Africa. Now there is 1.2 billion people on the continent of Africa. In the 1960s, there was only 10 million Christians. And of the 40 million people, of the 40 million people on the continent of Africa, in the last 50 years since I've been alive, praise the Lord, the number has gone from 10 million to 50 million Christians in Africa. Every single month, 20,000 Africans are born again. A month, 20,000 a month. God's Spirit has been poured out over all the earth. Not only that, in the 1950s, in China, missionaries were expelled from there and left 3 million Catholics and 1 million Christians. In the 1960s forward, Christianity has grown from 1 million to 200 million. Revival is running all over China, and it's been known by unusual signs and wonders and even visitations, and many people have been raised from the dead. God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh in the last days. 10 to 25,000 Chinese are being born again monthly. There is 85 million believers in India. 40 million are Pentecostals. Every month, y'all know what a Pentecostal is, believes in the gifts of the Spirit, flows in the Holy Ghost. 40 million Pentecostals out of the 85 million in India. Every month, 100,000 Hindus are converted to Christianity. Uh, Let me say that again. Every month... 100,000 Hindus of the 85 million that are there are converted to Christianity. That's fifth in the world in the highest number of Pentecostals. Latin America in the 1960s, there was only 18 million Christians. Now there is over 480 million Christians. 70% of those are being baptized by the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. 35,000 Catholics a month are leaving their churches and getting filled with the Holy Ghost. God is pouring his spirit out on all flesh in these last days. Prior to 1960, it was illegal to live in Nepal if you were a Christian. After 1965, there was a there was 25 registered Christians in Nepal. In 50 years, there is 75 districts in Nepal, and in every district there are churches, and there is over 1 million believers in Nepal as of today. God's Spirit has been poured out on all flesh in these last days. Oh, if there's not a stirring inside of your spirit, man, right now, I have to ask you a question. Are you saved? 
There should be something bubbling up on the inside of you. The world has fallen apart, but God has poured out his spirit in these last days. In South Korea, at the turn of the century, there was no Christian churches. For the early 1960s, from, from the early 1960s, now there's 30, 33% of South Korea is Christian. And over 7,000 churches are now in Seoul, Korea alone. 7,000 churches in Seoul, Korea alone. Some of those churches have over 1 million members. The churches in Korea send more missionaries around the world only second to the United States of America. 667 an hour, 16,000 a day, almost 6 million Muslims a year are being converted to Christianity worldwide. God is pouring out his spirit in these last days. The world is falling apart, but God is doing something big in these last days. And I want you to know, we're a part of it. Come on, we're a part of it. Even though we have this little bubble in Gaines County, God is still pouring out his spirit upon all flesh in these last days. As I was praying, I was asking the Lord, especially after, you know, seeing all the news about, you know, the elections and, and the ballots and all the stuff that's going on. I've just been praying. How many has been praying for our country? and praying for all of this that's going on. We love our country. There's just so much going on. There's so much evil. There's so much, it's just so much going on. And I began to pray. And the Lord wanted me to give you guys four things today that you can hold on to during these uncertain times. And specifically, I want you to know this, that God loves the church. Let me say it again. God loves the church. And we've talked about what the church looks like, what the church is. Now, scripturally speaking, we see two types of churches in the Bible. We see the universal church where believers all over the world, even right now, all over the world are having church. But we're all a part of the family of God, which is the universal church. But then we know in the New Testament, many of the books of the Bible in the New Testament were written to a local church. So it tells me that I think it's like two-thirds of the New Testament was written to local churches or pastors of local churches. So to have this mentality, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, is true to a certain extent. You can be saved anywhere. When you call on the name of the Lord, you are a part of the family of God. Jesus is your Savior. But the church isn't necessarily everywhere when it comes to you and I coming to a local church. Time and time again, we see in Jesus' ministry during those three years, he was walking the streets, and most of the time as he was walking from one place to another, he was actually walking to one temple or one church to another, and he taught and he preached time and time again in local churches. We are called to be a part of a local church. You and I, we're a part of a local church called Transformation Church. So don't be deceived in thinking, I don't have to go to church. No, you need to be a part of a local church. It is 100% scriptural to go to church. Number one, in uncertain times, the church will become a place of refuge. In these last, time, in these last days, in these uncertain times, the church, I'm talking universally as well as Transformation Church, will become a place of refuge. And I'm going to show you in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. What Jesus said here, I've been meditating on this and reading this, praying over you praying over our church, over our communities, over the world with this scripture. This has been a, a scripture I call the hook scripture. Every time I'm praying, this scripture comes up. Jesus said in verse 18, And I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Notice Jesus said, I will build my church. If you look up that word church in the Greek, original Greek, it means a group of people leaving their homes, 
going to a central location wherever they lift up the name of Jesus or whenever they worship their God. They all come together in one central location, like what we call here church. Goes on, Jesus said, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. This word prevail, it means this, to prove more powerful than an opposing force. So when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prove more powerful than anything. Or we can say it like this, and the gates of hell will not be more powerful than the church. I'll say it again. And the gates of hell will not be more powerful than the church. I'll say it again until you can get this down inside of you. The gates of hell will not be more powerful than the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail, will not have more power than the church. So this tells me regardless of what Satan is trying to do in this world, it will not prevail against the church. I didn't say this, the Apostle Paul didn't say this, or anybody, Jesus said it. Jesus said, I'm building my church, I'm growing my church, and in the last days, even the gates of hell will not be more powerful than the growth that's going to take place in the church. It's a promise from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's a covenant that he's made with mankind. The moment that you say, Jesus, come into my heart. Take away my sin. The moment that you become a part of the family of God, the church, you have supernatural power on the inside of you. Supernatural power as we come together. And the gates of hell will not overcome the church. Will not overpower the church. Will not cause any kind of of defeat that could come to the church. I looked up this word gates. This word gates means an object. Obviously, we know this swings as an entrance or either to close or to open. And when Jesus made this statement, and the gates, what comes out of hell, what goes into hell, will never prevail against the church. So whatever Satan tries to send into your family or take away from your family, it will not prevail against you. Whatever he tries to take away from our country or whatever he tries to put into our country, according to the word of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, it will not prevail against the church. The news can say whatever. Everybody can have their own views and opinions about what's going on. But there's the truth that will remain forever. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. So in uncertain times, the church will become a place of refuge. Whenever you know that things around in the world are falling apart, you just can't wait to get into His presence like this, knowing that being in a corporate setting like this, there's security, there's there's a place of refuge to where you can just lay aside all the stuff that's going on in your life, and you can just worship God. You can lift up your hands and, and just praise Him and just worship Him, knowing that in that presence, you have this place of refuge to where you can just declare the gates of hell is not going to prevail. When I walk out these doors and I go to my job and I go through all the pressure and all the stuff, I have this assurance from Jesus, the Messiah, the one who is and the one who is to come, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Number two, what is the purpose of the church in these uncertain times? In uncertain times, the church will become a place for times of refreshing. For times of refreshing. Turn to Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. We find Peter, he's standing up, and powerful miracles were taking place. And he said this to the crowd. He said, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. There are must be a time in your week to where you can come to a place like this and worship the king and receive from the word so you can have that time of refreshing. Here we find in verse number 19 that there must be repentance 
for there to be conversion and our sins will be blotted out. But there's a promise that there will be times of refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. Can you be refreshed on a personal level? Absolutely. But there's something special about coming into the house of the Lord, to a local church where the corporate anointing is here, where his presence is here, where you can be refreshed by the spirit of the living God. Let me make this statement to you. You can only give out what you put in. I'll say that again. You can only give out what you put in. You can only give out what you put in. If you're constantly bombarded by the evils of this world and you don't come to a place where you can be refreshed, you're fighting a battle from a weak side. But when you can come into the house of the Lord and be refreshed and be strengthened, you can go right back out into the evils of the world and face it head on, knowing that the gates of hell should not prevail against me. It's those times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. We had that today during worship. Such a powerful time during praise and worship today. It was a time of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Sure, can you listen to Christian music on the radio? Absolutely, but it's not like what we just had 20 minutes ago. You can be in your house and watching a great podcast and all those kind of things, but it can't compare to what we just had right here, right now. Turn to Acts chapter 4, go over another chapter. In uncertain times, the church will become a place of escape from the pressures of the world. People will come to church to escape all the pressures of this world. Acts chapter 4, verse 23, let me show you. In being let go, they had just suffered a tremendous amount of persecution. They went to their what? Their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. They had to go back to their own company. It was a place of escape from all the persecution and all the trials and all the, all the stuff that was going on in their lives. What did they do? They went to their own companions. They, they, they came together. You can almost say it was like a church service. And when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. There will be the need in these last days for all of us to escape the pressures of this world. That's why Transformation Church is here for you. You'll be facing, we will all be facing. Jesus said all the things that we're going to be facing in these last days. You can't skip out from church and expect to be refreshed. You can't skip out of coming to church and expect to, to, to go on and not be bombarded by the pressures of this world. When you come to God's house, you can escape the pressures of the world where you can lift up your voice to God in one accord, to where you can say, God, regardless of what's going on around me, you made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in there. You are still God, and the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. I've noticed this in these last days more so than ever because of the pressures of the world. Christians are finding different ways to escape all the things that's going on other than church. This is a very bold message today. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I love you. And because I'm, well, I'll just say it, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of God in a very very righteous way, not a scared way, but a very honoring way. And if I don't stand before this pulpit or behind this pulpit and tell you what's going on in the world, I'll have to stand before God on that. And so I have to stand before you today and say this, it's okay to go on vacation. It's okay to do all those kind of things. But you need this place to escape from all the pressures of the world. You need God's presence It's great to hang out with your family. It's great to go and do all the things you do. But don't forsake that for being in God's presence because the world is going to get worse and worse. The last thing we as believers need to do is isolate ourselves from the body of Christ because we want to escape all the pressures of the world. Being let go, they went to their own companions. Number four, turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13. In uncertain times, the church will become a place 
from which God's light will shine to the world. I'll say that again. In uncertain times, the church will become a place from which God's light will shine to the world. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are coming into the house. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There's two things that Jesus compared us as Christians, as the church. One, we are compared to salt. And when Jesus was given this example, you are salt of the earth, we know that when salt is applied, it actually dissolves inwardly and it disappears. Actually, I believe Jesus was talking about not just adding flavor to to, um, our situations and the things that we're facing, but salt. Actually, it speaks of the inward parts of us. Actually, in these last days, the character of Christianity is going to rise. We are going to be more like Christ than ever before. We are going to shine brighter. We're going to be that salt. And the character or the characteristics of Christ are going to start coming out of us like never before. In Jesus, he uses light as an example He described his people as being light, which is not only outside, but it shines in the dark places. And the light speaks of the testimony that we all have of what Jesus has done for us. It's revealing and illuminating the truth that the whole world needs today. Now, we know that Jesus, he talks about this light, and he talks about the strength of that light coming together, collectively coming together, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. I remember many years ago, the first time I went to Mexico, um, we were flying into Mexico City. And if you guys know much about Mexico City, it's one of the largest cities in the world. It's huge. And flying in, it, the, the, the plane kind of went down to you know, a lower elevation. And as we're coming in, I could look out the window and I could see the lights of Mexico City way out there. You can see the lights from a distance. And as we got closer to Mexico City, the lights began to get brighter and brighter. And as we started flying over Mexico City, you could just see lights everywhere. But because Mexico City is so large, it took for it seemed like forever to finally get to the airport and land because Mexico City is so large. And I began to think about this. Each one of those lights represents a house. But that one light in that One house, separated by itself, can only shine so much. But when you get all the lights together in one place, how much brighter is that light in the darkness? That's why when Jesus said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, when we all come together like this, our light is shining bright in the darkness. Sure, you can be the light in your job place. You can be the light in your family. You can be the light in the areas that you influence, and that is going to always penetrate the darkness. Oh, but when two or three are gathered together, he's there, and the light shines brighter and brighter when you collectively come together as the church. As Christians come together, there's a glow for the Lord that we We can't really create individually. No, it's when we come together. There's this bright light of glow, and it will be the brightest in these last days. In fact, we shine the brightest when we shine together as a church. That's why for decades, Satan's tried to separate the church, tried to do it. I mean, why did they try to do this even during this this whole quarantine and and trying to get churches to stop and all that kind of stuff? Satan's trying to get darkness. He's trying to take the light out. But he didn't know that when, when churches went on websites and they went on live stream and everything, how much further the gospel would be spread. It's huge. In fact, if you guys know much about biblical history, whenever the printing press was created, the Bibles were reprinted by the thousands. 
And they were thinking, oh, the printing press could be the worst thing ever because it's printing all kinds of evil and all that. No, in all actuality, Bibles were reprinted all over the world, and the gospel spread because of the printing press. The gospel is being spread by the Internet because people are watching church services that can't attend church. What the devil thought was bad, God turned it for good. Now there's people getting saved all over the world through the Internet. You can't stop the church. Come on, nothing can prevail against the church. No virus, no government, nothing can prevail against the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. There's no power on this earth that's going to stop the church from growing. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's a promise. It's a covenant from our Heavenly Father to our Son, and He's declared we will prevail in these last days. We will overcome in these last days. You and I, we are part of the greatest move of God in these last days. He's pouring out his spirit on us. Hallelujah. Do not fear when you see wars and rumors of wars. Do not fear about what could happen with the election. Do not fear. No, God's got it. God's got it. Should Christians still have a voice? Absolutely. We should speak on righteousness. We should stand up for what is right. But know this, above everything, God is still on the throne. And the church will always prevail. The church, it don't matter what kind of government at all, Republican, Democrat, don't matter. The church will prevail. That's what he said. Woo, I'm getting stirred up. The church will prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Hallelujah. So this is what I want to do. As John comes up, we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Church, when we come together, we need to pray. So I want us all to stand to our feet. We're going to pray for our country. We're going to pray for our communities. And just know that we are a light, not individually, but together corporately, that's going to shine bright in these last days. So let's pray for our country. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just lift up our country. We are honored to be called Americans. We are called by you to be in this country. You knew when we were conceived that we would be Americans. We're honored to be a part of the United States of America. But as believers, as Christians, as the church, we are standing against the evils of this world. We take our authority and our rights as believers the rights that you've given us in your name, Jesus. Our rights that you've given us when you ascended down into hell and you got the keys and you, you came back and you're sitting at the right hand of the Father and you gave us the keys of the kingdom and you've given us the right to rule and reign. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we believe that we will not in this hour and in this time, shrink away from our responsibility to stand for righteousness and truth. The church will be built by Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We lift up these elections to you. What's hidden will be revealed in Jesus' name. What is hidden will be revealed in Jesus' name. The truth will prevail in Jesus' name. Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we call on the truth to prevail over all untruth, all deception in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, we believe that your spirit's been poured out on all flesh. And just as I read of the revivals that's taken place all over the world, it's our turn now. Jesus, it's our turn now. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, pour yourself out like never before on our country. Pour yourself out like a mighty rushing river over our country. Wash out the evil and bring in all of the truth that is needed in these last days. We believe you, Father. We trust you. 
and we will stand like you said. Stand in these last days. It'll save our souls. So, Father, we love you so much. Come on, let's just love on him right now. Just lift up your hands and worship him. We're so thankful, Father. Come on, your voice is your address into the spirit realm. He loves your voice. Your voice is like no other voice. He created your voice different than anybody else's. So we lift up our voices in this place as lights corporately coming together that shines bright on the hill. And we declare, Father, we love you. We commit our lives to you. We commit our, all of our, ourselves to you. Spirit, we'll be obedient to you. We'll follow you. We'll be led by you. We keep ourselves stirred up in these days. We won't fall away. We won't, we won't back down. No, we'll pursue you more and more each and every day. We thank you, Father, right now. In these last days, we will be, the church will be that place of refuge. That church will be that place of a times of refreshing and that place where people can escape all the wickedness and the pressures of the world. But even in these last days, the church is going to shine brighter than ever before. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you're here today. And you've fallen away from God. You've turned your back on God. At one time, maybe you were in church and you love God. You were actually pursuing. You were very passionate for, for Him. And you, you turned your life over to Him. But just the cares of this world and just maybe schedules or whatever it is just kept you from being in His presence. And you've fallen away. You're living like the world again. And honestly, you really just don't even know how it happened. It just happened. But you... You realize today by the Spirit of God that you need to come home and that you need to get your life right and start standing for Him again. If that's you, just raise your hand wherever you're at. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Say, yes, thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else, thank you for that hand. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to pray this prayer together. So everybody across this place, even online, just put your hand over your heart and just repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I need you. The world is getting crazy, but I need a Savior. I've turned my back on you, but today I'm coming back. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me. Take away all my sin. From this day forward, I commit my life to you. Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, help me. I need you to comfort me. Teach me and guide me. But I commit to be with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Say that after me, say, And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Say one more time, And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Y'all believe that today? Amen. Once you high five somebody, say, I'm glad you made the church. You guys are dismissed. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night.